Hi, everybody. Welcome to this talk, which I think might be our final public talk of the year. So congratulations to everybody for making it almost through a, another academic year. Uh, my name is Jeff Sibo, and I teach animal studies at New York University. And I am honored to be co-hosting this talk with my colleague, Becca Franks. Uh, we have a very, very special uh, speaker for, for everybody today. So uh, I, can, I can say a few things by way of introduction, and then we can get straight into the talk. So as a general note, this talk is part of the Animal Law and Policy Speaker Series at NYU Animal Studies. This speaker series is generously supported by the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy. And so thanks very much to the Brooks Institute for supporting this series and supporting our work in general, as well as other valuable work in the space. We really appreciate it. Uh, and this is uh, part of a, a more general constellation of activities happening at NYU Animal Studies. So if people generally have interest in undergraduate education in animal studies or graduate education in animal studies or research or outreach or other public events, please do go to the NYU Animal Studies or the NYU Environmental Studies website and you can find email lists and information and, and lots of exciting material to search through. Okay, so uh, with, with that said, I, like I said, am very, very happy to be able to introduce uh, Jennifer Jacquet. Uh, Jennifer Jacquet is interested in patterns across transboundary environmental problems and the attempts to address them. She is a professor of environmental science and policy at the Rosenstiel School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science at the University of Miami and affiliated faculty with the Abess Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy. From 2012 to 2022, she was faculty in the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University, a former colleague of ours, and I will add, is uh, starting in fall 24, uh, going to resume a position as an external uh, executive committee member at the NYU Center for Environmental and Animal Protection. So we can hold on to that connection with uh, Jennifer, which we are very, very happy about. Uh, she is also the author of Is Shame Necessary from 2015 and The Playbook from 2022. So I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer in a second, uh, but in the meantime, I just want to remind everybody of our format. So Jennifer will talk for however long she wants to talk. And uh, then when we reach the discussion portion, Becca is going to engage in a conversation with Jennifer in part by drawing from questions and comments and objections and other interventions that everybody here can offer in the Q&A tab. So, so at any point during the talk, please feel free to click over to the Q&A tab, not the chat, the Q&A tab, and enter your questions or comments or objections, and feel free to upvote or reply to other questions and comments and objections. And then Becca will be able to draw from that when, when having a conversation with Jennifer later, later on in this session. So, so with all that, uh, said again, uh, thank you so much for for being here, Jennifer. Really looking forward to the talk, and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Nice to hear your voice, see your face, <laughs> and let me um, just cue up the slides. So you know, I have um, given many talks about the case against octopus farming, and. I didn't want to do that again because I have done it so many times that some of them are online. If you're really interested in the sort of framework and arguments that we put forward um, in detail, you can you can find those there and um, and I'll certainly rehash them a bit here. But really what this talk um, inspired me to do was sort of reflect over the last decade, because as you'll see, I sort of started thinking about this issue almost 10 years ago and I also wanted to reflect on how important NYU Animal Studies has been to my thinking on this and the kind of conversations that it's inspired. So this is kind of like a meta talk or something. And um, and I'm excited to be here with all of you. I saw a lot of familiar names in the, in the attendee list, and I hope that we can have lots of time for discussion afterward. So as a backdrop, of course, to octopus farming is just the rapid growth in aquaculture or the farming of aquatic species in general. And as you can see, this dark blue bar, that's the, um, the farming of marine species in particular. The light blue is freshwater species or freshwater uh, biomass. This is, this is in millions of tons here on the y-axis. This is from the Food and Agriculture Organization. And aquaculture is one of the fastest growing food industries 
um, although there's some skepticism around, around some of the numbers. But um, alongside the growth in biomass has been, unlike with terrestrial species, the rapid domestication of aquatic species and especially marine species. So there was a nice paper in Science in 2007 showing that about 430 aquatic species have been domesticated since the 20th century and 106, like nearly a quarter of those had uh, been domesticated just over the past decade or put into mass production. And we know almost nothing about these species, let alone the individuals. This was wonderful work led by Becca Franks, who's here today, um, showing that, you know, in 2018, we were farming about 408, well, not about 408 aquatic species. And that specialized welfare information from the web of science was only available for 84 species in total. So that means, you know, the vast majority of species have no uh, welfare consideration or, or knowledge at all. And you can see that sort of mapped out. We know only uh, if you consider five papers or more on welfare knowledge or, or sort of um, sufficient knowledge, which which most of us probably don't anyway, you'll see that um, no invertebrate matches that category. Only the vertebrate, some of the vertebrate aquatic species get there. So that's the backdrop uh, through which we should all be viewing this new activity called octopus farming, which I first heard about in August 2014. So that brings us again back to almost a decade. Um, I read this pretty creepy article that came across my desk for some reason on um, on how octopus farming was going to be the next big thing in aquaculture, written by a researcher at in Vigo, uh, Spain, which uh, has invested a lot in understanding and promoting aquaculture, especially in the scientific literature. And the arguments for octopus farming are pretty clear. These are fast growing animals. They have short lifespans of one to two years. They don't require parental rearing. They are consumed in luxury markets. Wild octopuses are pretty high value and uh, desired in, in high markets, especially in Spain, um, that this would create jobs. I mean, you won't find an argument to do anything without the, the job creation argument. And that the only reason farming was stalled at this point, and they felt certain that it wouldn't be for long, was due to certain life history characteristics of octopuses that namely that they were really hard to rear in captivity. It was difficult to what they call close the life cycle. Um, and that also there were high degrees of, of cannibalism and then there was their, their notoriously picky eaters. Um, and so they prefer live prey. Um, and then if it's frozen prey, it better be pretty, pretty high class. Um, oct octopuses are carnivorous. And of course that then perpetuates or puts additional pressure on wild species that we have to catch to feed them, but that will come up in a moment. Okay, so this was August 2014, and it starts, I start sort of ruminating on this question. And lots is going on, lots is going on in the background about octopuses as well. So in May of 2015, Cy Montgomery publishes her book, it takes a little while to gain steam and momentum, but called The Soul of an Octopus. And uh, she famously got to know an individual octopus in the Seattle Aquarium, and you can see her sort of fondling, I think it was her here. And, um, and again, it sort of expresses that there's something in the air, I think, about octopuses at the time. And then in April 2016 at NYU, we put together this event called Seeing Seafood as Animals. And this was a really important event for me because it was the first time I stood alongside Becca Franks on a stage. Uh, she gave a wonderful presentation about, um, about fish welfare and play. And Peter Godfrey Smith, who many of us will know, I have been preparing for his, this talk, you know, having his book, Other Minds, right here. Uh, I think this came out just shortly before this. And he gave a wonderful talk on, on uh, aquatic animals generally, I believe. And that right after that event, I was checking my, my sort of email history. We emailed about um, this, this case of inky octopus escaping from the New Zealand 
aquarium. And this has this case is one of many that has earned octopuses this I this kind of uh, reputation as an escape artist. And then the following year, okay, by the way, you know, I'm still thinking about the octopus farming, still not doing much, but the following year, um, we have this wonderful event um, that I was honored to be part of. I know Jeff Sebo was there, Peter Godfrey Smith again was there, Dan Dennett was there, um, Victoria Braithwaite was there on animal consciousness, and Peter Godfrey Smith gave a talk about octopuses, and as he was giving that talk, I remember thinking, we really have to write something against octopus farming. So after this event, um, I sort of got really serious about that and rolled up my sleeves. Becca was always supportive. Um, Peter was moderately supportive and, and sort, of, sort of interested, convinced him to get more interested after this event. And especially through sending him some videos that I found on YouTube, which again sort of speaks to how we sort of view evidence, I think, in the 21st century. But these videos I'd found on YouTube of them farming or really ranching octopuses in Australia, I just want you to see the conditions here. And I I was looking back at my correspondence and this, this video evidence seemed very persuasive to Peter who was sort of on the fence on whether or not to come out against farming sort of broadly because, um, because he had some quandaries with that. And in seeing octopuses in these conditions, um, he he said, "Okay, you know, really, let's let's go forward. Um, this is not the way these animals should should be living." So we finally got off the ground at least a, a kind of an essay, uh, or actually, it was a, it was a scientific paper with full of citations um, and a pitch, which I said to Nature. I knew somebody there, an editor there, and Nature's done some good things previously on, on animal topics. No luck, sent it to trends in ecology and evolution, no luck, sent it to bioscience, the full article, no luck, sent it to Proc B, rejected. And this, if any of you have been in this situation and all of you will be eventually who join academia because it's a, a, an activity full of failure, um, scientific publishing that is, uh, it's pretty demoralizing. And every time you have to sort of brush yourself off and try to convince your co-authors you're not a loser as well and, and sort of try to resubmit somewhere else. And that was over the course of a year. You know, meanwhile, this issue is not, not getting any younger. And I remember I was speaking to Dale Jameson, who all, many of you will know, all of you will know by name, many of you will know personally, about my frustration with um, with the scientific publishing process. And he said, you know, I have a friend at Issues in Science and Technology and I could send him a, a sort of inquiry and see if he's interested. And lo and behold, he was interested probably again because of the way these things work, trusting Dale's opinion or reputation and agreed to have a look at our article, which eventually was published. Um, then for November 2018, we send it to him. By January 2019, it's, it's out. And Issues in Science and Technology is the popular arm of the National Academy of Sciences. It's not peer reviewed, um, but it got, you know, a good editorial, um, good ed editorial oversight. And we figured, let's get this, this argument into the light of day. Because to this point, the um, the writing in favor of uh, the writing about octopus farming was either explicitly like the piece I showed you or implicitly in the scientific literature in favor of farming. There was no discussion of the ethics around this issue. And in this piece that we had been working on again for over a year or thinking about for, for many years. Um, oh, this is a side note. Um, I'll go I'll go back to that in a second, but we out we outline. Um, really three main bodies of concern around the environmental impacts of, of octopus farming, which again, you can find a more rigorous treatment of both in the article and in subsequent iterations of that article or arguments in the popular media outlets. And that is again, the, the pressures that carnivores specifically put on wild, wild fish and, and, um, and other species, squid, hake, crabs, um, and the outputs then that the carnivores have to the system, they, they have phosphorus nitrogen outputs as a result of, of eating. 
Um, the impacts on the animals themselves, which I know everyone here is concerned about and cares about, but of course not everyone in the country or in the world does, unfortunately, to the same degree. But we, we make the strong case of, of course, that octopuses are capable of conscious experience. This is one of Peter Godfrey Smith's main um, assets that he could bring to these arguments. Um, that farming is incompatible with the welfare needed to meet their sophistication and exploration. Again, key points made by Becca Franks regularly about um, octopuses and many other species. And then the question of who was who was octopus going to feed anyway, because there's this argument that people have to eat. And we were sort of trying to draw this distinction between octopus that are have to be eaten for whatever reason, because there might be the only food available for some communities around the world, let's say small scale subsistence fishers in, in Mozambique, versus this kind of export mass production market really designed for high end, one could say sort of like uh, restaurant tours or um, tourists. And that the main importing countries were by no means going, were no means food insecure. Um, and so we had even found evidence of this um, later. I, I found this evidence from the industry themselves talking about why they're interested in farming octopuses or why they're interested in catching octopuses because of course, every octopus eaten right now is, is a wild octopus. And of course, the main drivers for the market were not because octopuses were going to feed hungry people, but because there was an increasing demand for exotic meats, rising disposable incomes, preferences were shifting toward octopuses for whatever reason, because people want to eat what they sort of find exotic, um, and that they were seen as, as relatively healthy. Okay, so that article comes out, the case against octopus farming, which again rests on these three main pillars of concern. And Peter Singer writes in response to our article a piece in favor of, of it, in favor of the argument. Um, probably no surprise to anyone here that that would be the case, except nice, of course, that he's, he dedicated the time to do that. And an uh, octopus um, biologist studies a lot of aspects of octopuses, including personality, Jennifer Mather, sort of takes a surprising stance of writing against the the argument we laid out. You can see, um, you can look this up and read it in whole, in, in its entirety, but you can just see in the first sentence, they have penned a diatribe against octopus farming with considerably more heat than light using generalized assumptions and selected facts. I had, I didn't know quite what to make of that first sentence, heat, more heat than light, except that the origins of life on the planet itself might come from hydrothermal vents. And so I thought, oh, maybe that's not so bad to have more heat than light. Um, but aside from that, which was really nice, of course, to have, you know, these other minds engaging with our argument, nothing much happened as a result of having published that the essay, The Case Against Octopus Farming. And we all sort of sat there, or, or certainly I did, Becca can speak for herself, but, and wondered, all right, what, what do we do next? And then something happened that was really, really lucky. Um, and that was that Robin, Robin McKay reached out to me from The Guardian and said, you know, I saw this article and I'd like to write about it for The Guardian. And it was like, yeah, all right, now, now we're talking. And he published this piece in, in May of 2019, which I just think is so interesting as to sort of how we think the world works, um, that it's, you know, almost five months after our article came out and Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, just as the aside, I'll, I'll come back to it right now, just to, to touch on it. When our article came out, which I really loved what Issues did with it, it came out with these incredible, this incredible artwork um, by Judy Fox. And these are sculptures of octopuses. There were a bunch of them um, featured in the article, which was just, to me, so lucky because I'd actually seen her work um, over a decade before that in, in LA. This is a really cool show she had on Snow White and Seven Sins. Um, but you can see her work is like really luscious and um, erotic and not unlike octopuses. It's no surprise that she would turn to, um, to turn to octopuses next. So that was an, another lucky element I thought of our piece is that 
they used representations of octopuses, which I really appreciated and I will come back to. But in this, um, I thought of that because as we came to the first sort of journalistic coverage, you can see one of the, the, the coverage was incredible. The writing was wonderful. The image I thought was problematic because you know, we're talking about octopus farming and here we have an octopus that's not, who's not being farmed at all. And by all accounts looks sort of, you know, wild and free and potentially happy. And so um, the representation of octopuses in the coverage would sort of become a topic of, of uh, um, interest, of, of interest to me. Okay, so after that happens and the Guardian article sparked some more journalism, journalism coverage, Compassion World Farming, this was also just this kind of amazing stroke of luck, launched a campaign and we talked to them in advance of this campaign in October of, of 2019 um, that, that reiterated and added to many of the points that we had made, um, this octopus factory farming recipe for disaster campaign. And they asked us in advance of this campaign if we would mind publishing some kind of scientific letter of support. And so we did that later that year, um, the original authors, we all got together and in July, 2019 in response actually to a, an article Jennifer Mather had written about octopus mines. Uh, we published a, a, an article saying, yes, the octopuses have mines and therefore we shouldn't farm them and got more than a hundred signatures of, of all people working in universities, all scholars and, um, and publish this in advance of the Compassion World Farming campaign to try to underscore that there was scientific support. And they were thinking about doing some work and still are, I think, in Brussels um, with some lobbying. And meanwhile, the journalism, again, the sort of popular media around this topic continues to, um, to snowball and gain momentum. But again, here you can see all of these images. This was a farm on the Yucatan. Um, where they're at least in the image slaughtering an octopus, which of course would be part of octopus farming. But in these other two images, again, you sort of see the octopus is re relatively wild and happy. And so um, I also worked with these um, these artists at from Tisch at NYU, who I adore, and they uh, they were students at the time when I met them. Not any longer what by the time they made this, but they they specialize, and this is to me totally New York and NYU in dystopian algorithmic art. And <laughs> I thought, okay, this is a really good fit. And they rendered this image of what octopus farming might look like, um, just so that we could have a touch point for you know for something that might model or or evoke what octopus farming might actually be. Okay, then in September, 2020, again, like what is going on in the universe? What is this decade of octopuses that we've been living through? But in September, 2020, we're all locked down. It's the middle of COVID-19. We all only have Netflix to comfort us. And this incredible movie comes out, My Octopus Teacher, that it seems that everyone in the world who watches Netflix sees. And it's, really incredible for so many reasons and it's also you know it also has some issues but mainly it gets people really thinking about octopuses and it does something that um that had never been done before to this degree um which is to bring someone into relationship with an individual octopus and into their environment for 500 days of filming apparently and so this is a, just a really big turn from that octopus is escaping from captivity, octopus is doing something interesting in an aquarium, opening a jar, Cy Montgomery befriending an octopus at the, at the Seattle Aquarium. This is about meeting her on her terms. And I think that's just really important for why, along with a bunch of other reasons that we could discuss, but for why this film is important. Um, but there are aspects of the film, as I mentioned, that we could all take take issue with. And one of them is when Craig Foster, who's the star and director of the film, um, mentions going into the scientific literature to learn about her. And she is a, a member of Octopus vulgaris, the common octopus, the most common octopus globally. And he 
goes into the scientific literature, but he doesn't mention that, you know, the third result in a Google Scholar search for this species will give you a paper about aquaculture. That actually so much of the literature around octopus vulgaris is about farming them. That is not mentioned in the film. So we try to capitalize as, as one does on this cultural moment by at NYU Animal Studies, bringing this film into conversation with other people who are also looking, thinking about octopuses. We had a wonderful event called Seeing Octopuses with Pippa Ehrlich, who's the co-director of My Octopus Teacher, um, Peter Gallison, again, Peter Godfrey Smith, Adi Khan. They, we had a really cool, again, it was on Zoom. We were still living in that world, but um, a cool event where we all talked about, or they all talked about what they saw when they saw particular clips of octopuses that they had not been um, aware that they would see. And so it was just a really kind of neat four person perspective on different elements of, of octopuses. And Becca and I um, used it many times. I think we gave uh, many conversations. Uh, this was one at Southampton, but um, after screenings of the film or in discussions of the film, using the film as a kind of primer for then talking about maybe what we owe octopus vulgaris or octopuses generally as a result of what we've learned or seen in the film. And uh, here we are on stage, we have custom shirts that say do not farm octopuses on them. And we use again the, the film to sort of promote to, pr to pr promote the work and the work again has been amplified by journalists and so it's this really weird, interesting cycle. In November 21, um, a group of, of philosophers and a sort of animal welfare scientists published this important report at the London School of Economics that's really a large scale review on the evidence of sentience in cephalopod mollusks and, and decapod crustaceans. And in this report, they call octopus farming um, with, with to high welfare standards currently um, impossible. They use the word impossible, which was a strong, strongly worded statement, of course. This is also notably not peer reviewed. It's, it's a LSE published report. That same month, um, pretty devastating news that Nueva Pescanova, a Spanish seafood company, plans to open the world's first and largest octopus farm, um, first commercial farm. There are, again, octopus farming to this point only exists in sort of experimental settings. Um, and no octopus farmed, no farmed octopus are sold on the global market. But this firm announces plans to open a farm and they, this will exist on the Grand Canary Islands, a former, well, a Spanish territory um, off of Africa. Compassion World Farming gets very active on this campaign. Sentient Media has been very active. The farm is currently stalled as a result of asking for more environmental permitting and review. And seeing those documents, like it looks like they still really are not up to stuff, but it's um, there's a site proposed and of course the species vulgaris and um, it looks as if it really could take off at any moment. So we've all been sort of living under this threat since November, 2021. And at the same time, we have, you know, some issues here at home in Hawaii, there was an octopus farm. It was actually a ranch. It was not for vulgaris, but uh, for a local species, they would uh, collect the larvae, raise them, and then um, basically bring, Suzanne Rust wrote this incredible piece of, uh, about these farms um, for the LA Times, but bring tourists by to sort of see and fondle these octopuses. They called it a farm, but it was really sort of more of a roadside zoo. And after this really uh, sort of scathing uh, reporting, and as well as I should mention, Fashion World Farming had already sent a, a notice of concern to the governor. There was a cease and desist issue to this farm and it is uh, still as of now closed. All right, and then in 2023 in Canada, they introduce in February 2023, just stuff starts happening everywhere. They introduced a, um, a petition to the federal, well, they had, in Canada, they have this interesting system where I think if you get more than 500 signatures, the House of Commons has to consider this 
this bill, um, or at least discuss it. And so they got, you can see here, over 17,000 signatures for a, um, a petition to talk about a ban on octopus farming and a ban on oct farmed octopus imports. Um, it was closed for signature in May. It was presented, there's Elizabeth May who's presenting it in October of 2023 last year. She had about a minute and a half to do so. It's on YouTube, you can watch it. And then the government response, they have 45 days maximum to respond, or they have this option that I don't quite understand. Maybe we can talk about that too, but um, they tabled their response. So this is currently stalled, this petition. Okay, then an octopus farming ban was introduced that same month. So again, February, it opens for signature. February of 2023, also um, some activists, legal scholars, and um, some interesting Congress people in the state of Washington uh, introduced House Bill 1153. And it has to pass the House uh, Ag Committee, and then it has to pass the House generally, then the Senate, and then we all, we've all forgotten how this works, or at least I had, um, and then has to be signed into law by the governor. Anyway, over the last year, um, this has happened, which was sort of shocking because it, got, it wound up getting tabled in the fall, new government and new agenda items come in in the new year, and it winds up getting picked up, passing the House, passing the Senate. I was, I was waiting in the wings to testify in the House in February 2023. I um, unfortunately got no airtime. The, the committee meeting was occupied entirely by issues between wolves and cattle. They gave octopuses, I think, two minutes at the end, um, but then they but then they passed it, and then it passed uh, the Senate, where I was able to testify in February 2023. It also passed, and in March 2024, the governor of Washington State signed this into being. And these two incredible um, activists were behind this bill. I must say, I, Amanda Fox and Josh Diamond, and they were watching and helping and pushing in every which way. Um, in ways that were just really, really cool to watch. And all of this momentum legally in the policy sphere has really generated, again, more headlines and, and just more um, visibility for the issue. NPR, here they are saying that a seafood firm, you know, wants to farm octopus. Activists say they're too smart for that. Again, look, it's that's February 2024 this year. This issue has been going on for a decade. But in February 2024, after this kind of galvanization around the, the political, um, in the political realm, NPR runs a story on it, which I just think is, is kind of neat as to how the world works, if there's any sort of recipe. Um, in February of this year, it's been introduced, uh, a, a farming ban and import ban has been introduced into California, and it has passed out of, um, out of the Ag Committee or the committee and now the state assembly and next stop it goes to the Senate. Here's Amanda Fox down in the bottom left of this photo. Aquatic Life Institute has also been involved and testified in this um, California case. It's also now been introduced as of February into Hawaii. And um, next stop, I think a farming ban will be introduced in Oregon. And again, all the while, the media is also covered, covering these cases. And one of my favorite pieces of press that came out in June of 2023 was in The Guardian by Ashifa Kassam. And it's a really long form piece of journalism, gets really deep. Uh, there are actually images of the Nueva Pesca Nova infrastructure that I really appreciated and lots of interviews with, with the uh, company itself. So this is part of my learning process is, you know, of course, reading all of the popular coverage and the kind of arguments that they sort of turn and make. And one of them is that they, they say that they plan to uh, feed the octopuses byproducts and that they're going to try to work more plants into their diet. So they know that diet has been a major concern. It's been one of the features of the opposition. And this is where um, Amanda Fox also has been saying that they're worried about getting pushback at the state level about diet, that they could potentially um, argue, oh, well, we're, we're going to feed octopuses bycatch from fisheries um, or the offal, the, the trimmings from fish processing plants. We're not going to have to catch live squid or hake. I um, have really encouraged the journalists and, and 
Amanda Fox and others to put the burden of proof back on industry because I have seen no publications that Octopus vulgaris or anyone else is willing to eat these byproducts. If anything, octopuses have been notoriously picky eaters, again, wanting even live prey. And so the idea that they're going to eat trimmings or plants, again, I think needs to be sort of justified scientifically before we as a public trust these statements. The other thing that really hit me in the gut, and I'm almost finished, but is in this piece um, of reporting, you can see here um, some excerpts from, from industry. And let me just move my, move my. So the difference, and this is somebody from Nueva Pescanova talking, is that these are not wild octopus, but rather the fifth generation bred in captivity at the center. There's been an indirect select, select, selection process here, he says. That wasn't the goal, but in the end, you, you end up with the ones that are best suited to the conditions. The first generation had a different type of behavior, but this has evolved very positively. Save for a few large tubes for egg deposits in the female's tanks, the spaces are void of any kind of cognitive stimulus. At the beginning, we had nooks and crannies, parts of tubes or rocks for them because we thought we were going with what was known said Romero Perez. Little by little, we pulled them out as we realized they weren't needed. What's important is the temperatures, the oxygen levels, the pH, the light. And here's Jennifer Mather saying, if they've somehow or another managed to selectively breed calm octopuses, where is their data? But for me, I realized, oh, you know, this whole time I've sort of been arguing on these three pillars, this idea of the environmental impacts, the impacts to the animal welfare, and the and the food security arguments, but really deep down, and I think as an argument that's far less legible to the public, but maybe appreciated here um, in this kind of audience is the loss of wildness is really, I think what has motivated me and probably others as well to sign um, the, art of the, the letters and the, the petitions, because you're talking again about this kind of rapid domestication and the loss here they're talking about, you know, the loss of aggression, the loss of cannibalism, the loss of requiring cognitive stimulus, that they're breeding an animal that seems to look very different from its wild counterparts. And what they're what they're claiming in any case is in just five generations they have a very kind of different kind of individual on their hand so all of that sadness honestly that i feel over that because in the meantime you know i'm talking about a decade but that's that's those five generations that we're just hearing about five generations octopus are going to be the next big things they have a one to two year lifespan in this one decade where we've been trying to do just something, something to help them. There's already been five generations of octopus vulgaris bred in captivity. And now there is an effort put forward that I find really heartening, but again, needed at light speed um, that Senator, Lighthouse, Senator Whitehouse um, from Rhode Island will be introducing later this month a US federal ban. He's been watching the state efforts. He saw what happened in Washington state. His wife is an oceanographer. He's a huge supporter of the oceans. And he is going to try to put forward and, and hopefully pass. I know it's a long shot in this Congress, but um, a federal ban on octopus farming and farmed imports of octopuses. So just wrapping up um, with the takeaways as I was sort of reflecting on this decade, it remains to me a, a sort of really vexing paradox that octopuses are capturing our imagination, winning the Academy Award for Craig Foster, encouraging people to think differently about them. And that's octopus vulgaris. That's the exact same species that we're talking about under mass production by Pesco, Pesco Nueva. Um, they're capturing our imagination and that yet they're afforded few to no protections and, and let's, if we want, we can also talk about the wild capture octopuses, which are even in a worse predicament. Um, the other thing I have thought about in this takeaway is how messy social change and, and how unpredictable it is. 
um, really this is kind of this world, this like blender of journalists, activists, filmmakers, philanthropists, policymakers, like so hard to sort of identify any one person, one country, one NGO, one uh, state even sort of making the difference. There's just so much at play and really makes it difficult, I think, to sort of say like this is a roadmap or even something that could be replicated. Um, but it's need to be part of and um, and something I just emphasized is that uh, is the loss of wildness. And I know Lori Sellers and Becca Franks have a new paper on dewilding um, in the ocean and dewilding in general, but specifically uh, regarding aquaculture. And I'm really interested in this um, in the dewilding of of individuals um, and not just spaces. And perhaps we can talk about that moving forward. In any case, um, everyone here, if you're interested or want to um, register your name, I will be leading a, a, a letter in support of the federal ban and would be thrilled to have your support and signature. Um, that is actually happening this week. And I'm really grateful for your attention and excited to make something happen for these really incredible animals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's 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 a wild wild ride to like reflect back on where we started and like you know that first article that you found. It's it's really amazing. Um, so yeah, we have some questions coming in. Please put any um, clarification questions. You know any any thoughts or ideas that come to your mind just pop them in the q and I'll get to them. Um, and I think we're already seeing a lot of people asking uh, to have the letter. So maybe we can um, send that in the chat or after, after the fact, we can send it out to the email list. Um, while people are putting in some questions, I just wanted to start with a clarification question. So the, the, it's a farming and import ban in Washington as well. And can so you that, talk a little bit about why those are different and how they're both important and you know the different the trade-offs there? So the Washington ban, I believe, is just farming. The California bill is a import and farming ban. Yeah. The um, Hawaii bill, I think, is just a farming ban. Again, some some people in the in attendees will know this even more than I do, and so they are welcome to chime in. The federal ban is a ban on farming and imports. Okay. And so um, notably, of course, you, you've probably heard this anecdotally from like car, especially car manufacturing. Like if California decides to do something, all the, cal all the states sort of pander to them because it's such a large market. I don't know if that the reverse is also true, right? Because if they're saying we won't import something, but I feel like um, for the import ban that would happen federally, fingers crossed, um, there is no doubt that this Pesca, uh, Nueva Pesca Nova would still have a market in Europe, of course, but that without the US, I do think things start to look less attractive to its investors and, and, um, and possibly, you know, some of the even outside firms that are involved. I think Cook Seafood in Canada is also thinking about getting involved with with that farm. So, so all that to say, you know, like the federal ban doesn't solve the problem in the United States. We still have to think about Europe, Japan, China. You know, it's just this incredibly massive undertaking. But it's these dominoes that must fall. It feels like in in whatever sequence we can get them. And the US was on that list of like main importers that you had, right? And then it was like also Italy and so like something in Europe. It seems like if this can get more headlines about the actual bills that are being passed, like the Europeans are not gonna wanna like let us get away with like being more progressive on this issue than them. I could imagine that um, being an issue for some EU legislators. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I like your thinking. That's sort of what I find interesting about these state bans too. It's like the West Coast, right? And then all of a sudden, the federal government's interest. Someone in Rhode Island, you know, Senator in Rhode Island's going to, and it just has this kind of swirl or blender. Like, I don't know. I don't know how it will all work. And I'm, I'm delighted to get to watch it, but hoping it all happens more quickly because of the lives we're dealing with. There, yeah, there's so many, and, and just the psychology of individual legislators, there's so many issues at stake. Um, so uh, yeah, this this is, this. is you've mentioned this a few times, but um, I think maybe just talking about it in more depth from Susan Crane is asking about um, the difference between like domestication versus just like at what, what put in production, like, you know, the uh, the farm trying to make the case that they're somehow domesticated in five generations um, and the sort of slipperiness of the term domestication and how that can be leveraged in different sorts of ways versus, you know, just actually saying, no, they're just in production. It's not the same thing as being domesticated. Yeah, I'm really curious. And, and again, we'll have to defer to people with more expertise than I have, but where that line ever is, you know, where, where we say, oh, these, these are, I mean, between sort of dogs, wild dogs, the wolf. Um, it's a process, obviously. And I think what that headline or the article at least shows us is that process is underway, whether or not it's a discrete event. Yeah. Um, and I hope that in five generations, it's not discrete. One of the things that I, in reflecting on this decade and, and the octopuses themselves, and especially vulgaris, that I've appreciated is how much they've resisted domestication. And you yeah. look and we are just trying everything and they are resisting. And it's like, you close the, the window and they go out the door. They are really trying not to be in these systems. And I feel like that's really important or energizing somehow to this whole endeavor, you know? Um, but I agree that it's even Duarte's framing the rapid domestication of marine species. Is it is it obvious that any of these species are fully domesticated the way you might argue a dog is or um, or or maybe a cow? It, and I, it's also gotten me thinking about you know these other domesticated terrestrial species or what we call terrestrial and how you know I think we know this from the literature but how different they would be in a different wild context. So I agree there's something important and deep there, and I'm probably just have not equipped or haven't thought about it enough to answer it. But, um, but in any case, the, the sadness I felt at the idea that these wild traits were sort of slipping away. And I started looking this morning and didn't have time, but um, you know, this is a concern even in the wild. And I think it's a concern even for wild octopuses because when you have predator release, and this is the this is what people are saying why we have so many wild octopuses right now and why we're catching so many and why there's a market is that we've actually seen an increase in catches of wild octopuses and some people speculate it's because of the elimination of predators yeah. and so they are having a, a heyday in the ocean that i think is an empirical question that is up for debate but in any case even through that predator release you can see um, at least in large mammals on land very rapid evolutionary responses to predator release that we might also be seeing and like in other words even taking this generation of vulgaris might be very different than having taken vulgaris 100 years ago and trying to domesticate them yeah yeah i mean and and, and obviously there's a motivation for the you know the corporate leaders to say that the octopuses have changed in five generations and um so it's a motivated statement and i wonder how much you trust it like do you think i mean because like jennifer mather pointed out well where's your data that this has actually happened like it oh they don't need these toys anymore because they're not you know even the word need like yeah. how have you determined that they don't need them and um how have you determined that they're less aggressive versus withdrawn um, and you know, you, because we're working on the letter, you know the new paper that's out in animals showing that uh, you put octopus vulgaris in barren environments and they are socially withdrawn and not showing. 
they're not showing the wild traits and that's not because they're not there it's because they're depressed or you know um, learned helplessness or whatever and i think um i guess i sort of think it could cut both ways and in a world where i was happier a ceo would be afraid of saying that uh, an octopus had lost some of its wild aggression because that would be something we as the public held so dear and cherished so much that they would be like, oh no, we have a really enriched environment where they can express all of the wild traits. They are as aggressive as ever. And um, and I think that's kind of speaks again to the paradox that they're in because of course they can't have it both ways. And so if we cherish wildness, a statement like that, I think doesn't really behoove them in the same way. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so turning to a bunch of questions that have come in here, um, I'm going to, since we were just speaking about Europe, um, I'm going to take one from Rita Santos, who writes, hello, thank you for this talk. I'm from Portugal, and I was wondering if you came across any information about plans here. Um, I was aware of the Nueva Pesca Nova in Spain, but some time ago I saw mentioned in a video for the Eurogroup for Animals that there were also some plants here in Portugal as well. I haven't been able to find anything, but I was wondering if you had come across and thank you for your hard work on you. On this Likewise, issue. I haven't seen anything specific for Portugal and I have seen um, I don't want, I, it's certainly not disinformation, but I have seen some misinformation around this issue, right? Um, sometimes when the media is talking about it, it will get sort of reframed framed or spun. Um, for instance, like British Columbia was talking about, like, they'll never build a farm in Brit and there was no farm plan for British Columbia, as far as I could tell, but that was kind of an angle that people were speaking about. Um, with octopuses. With octopuses, yeah. So it's... Um, you know, I'd, on the other hand, who knows where these rumors begin and how it, it's very likely that somebody in some boardroom, right, is talking about, and it's and it's definitely, it's certainly true that Spain and Portugal have both been interested and invested in octopus farming. So that is not outlandish to think at all. It's more that uh, I have not seen anything specific, um, you know, come across the internet or the fish news sites that I follow that that do make these announcements but at this point also it may be that if you are planning it you lay really low um compared to see you, th you think it might have gotten to that point where they are trying to they're they're feeling enough heat that uh that they're they're laying low now i i'm not i don't i have no idea i'm just saying it could, it could any be. of the above could be true right yeah yeah it could be any of the above and so and relatedly do you Sorry, go ahead. I don't want to discount it, but I haven't seen any evidence. Hmm. Um, and relatedly, I actually was wondering this um, while I was listening. Do you do you intentionally seek out industry magazines and publications to see where where their their thinking is, so you can proactively and preemptively get in front of it, rather than just always being on the defensive, reactive end of the spectrum? Yeah, and I think not just me, but the but the NGOs involved are really good at that too. I think Compassion's been really good at that. I think that um, the, having the Animal Legal Defense Fund involved now is great. It would be wonderful to see more environmental NGOs take up this issue. And yeah. um, Senator Whitehouse's office is also looking for NGO support. So if anybody here is um, in, is involved with an NGO, I'd like to see Earth Justice, for instance, get involved. But yeah. I think that's part of campaigning on anything is trying to stay in front. I'm not particularly good at that because I'm just me, but it's certainly true that I monitor those sites. Yeah, great. Um, so on the flip side, Richard Gibson is asking if there's anything for um, ethically acceptable alternatives that might satisfy demand that you've come across or know of. You mean like cellular octopuses, octopus culturing? Any anything along those lines? I mean, I, I I imagine that's what the question is about, and I think it's it's an interesting one to consider. Like, not just the ban, but then also, you know, would there be a way to like yeah. have some sort of alternative that was not actually an octopus? Yeah, I have to say that I'm pretty torn myself because. 
as you know, Becca, in getting the 100 signatures on the letter, we had to be very specific that it was not about not eating octopuses, it was about not farming them. And in some ways, that could actually put more pressure on wild octopuses, which, yes, live arguably a better life, I mean, almost certainly a better life than a farmed octopus would, but nevertheless are, you know, subjected to all sorts of cruelties in the process of hunting them and then killing them. So I don't necessarily believe that wild octopuses are a better alternative. Some of the people who signed that letter do believe that. Um, I am hugely in support of cellular octopus cultivation as long as, of course, as it doesn't lead to other forms of, you know, I, I think it's up for debate whether or not fake fur actually reduced demand for, for real yeah. fur. Um, but, and then, and plant-based alternatives, although to me, octopuses is looking like such a luxury commodity whenever I'm digging into things that plant-based octopuses, this doesn't, doesn't seem to, I think, hold a lot of promise. So, potentially cultivated. And I don't know why, it's been something I've been meaning to ask GFI, Good Food Institute, why why more firms aren't doing anything with octopuses, because it seems like a good product. Yeah, great. Um, one of the questions, let's see. Um, so Ken Hopkins is asking, what are the examples of byproducts in feeding? Is it some part of other animal agriculture industry like fish meal from aquaculture processing. Um, so I think also just talking about this bribe products thing in relation to the conversation we're just having right now about, you know, there's sort of like this almost like essentialization of the market, like, oh, there's this much that's going to be eaten. And if we can just put in this other thing, then we will have solved the problem rather than it's so much more dynamic. And as you know, the work that you're other work that you've shown is that, you know, there's not always, the replacement model is not always to be trusted. So I wonder if we can talk a little bit more about bycatch and the role it plays. And That's great. Um, I didn't put this in, but also for the special issue on aquaculture, where I mentioned your paper with Lori is likely to be published for Science Advances. Um, there is a paper that Matthew Hayek is on and Spencer Roberts, who's my PhD student has led on feeding global aquaculture. And I think when you look at the broader picture of feeding global aquaculture and you know, farming the tigers and lions of the sea and the problem with carnivorous species like Atlantic salmon, um, you quickly get into arguments of like, well, we can do byproducts and offal and trimmings are one of those. So those are not from animal ag, they are from seafood processing plants, both for wild and farmed species. So it gets really complicated quickly. But you have, you know, trimmings from those plants that get reconstituted back into fish meal. You have the wild caught, which about 20% of global catch is being turned into fish meal right now. Half of that more or less is destined for aquaculture and the other half is destined for pigs and chickens. So uh, again, it gets complicated because we're feeding, you know, terrestrial herbivores fish and we're feeding farmed fish, farmed fish. And it's like the whole mad cow weirdness. But, um, but the other thing that they're doing with fish meal and, and trying to do with salmon, and of course, what they were saying they were trying to do with octopuses, and I'm suspicious, is introduce plants into that as well. And I think this is part of what I view a process of domestication which is like really changing the, the diet. Uh, maybe you could argue that feeding chickens fish is part of their domestication, right? Um, just whatever you, it's, it's a sort of a market response. In that case, it's you know for protein to grow them more quickly. In the ideal world, I think they would love to feed octopuses a pure hake or squid diet or crab, but they just can't. Um, and so, you have this mix of, or what they're claiming is a mix, or at least what the fish meal industry claims, is a mix of wild trimmings and offal, and then plants, uh, soy or corn, that would otherwise be fed to terrestrial animals. And one thing that we point out in this paper that I think is worth thinking about is 
all of the attention's been on this thing called the, the fee conversion ratio and reducing that number of wild fish. And so that's why the industry is talking about that because they've had so much pressure to reduce the amount of wild fish going into farm fish because it makes no sense. But whenever you are able to reduce that, it's at, you're adding something else. And so now you're going to get this industry that looks more like meat and dairy that's causing deforestation in the Amazon Right, you're going to cause deforestation in the Amazon to eat farmed salmon or to eat farmed octopuses if you're lucky, if they're willing. And I again am dubious that at this point they really have the evidence to say that octopuses will eat that way, um, or grow, or grow well, or prosper is the the word um, that Senator Whitehouse added to our letter. And I'm like prosper. I just don't see any hope of that. But yes. Um, so yeah, I think the, the feed conversation is really dull to most people and it's really important. Yeah, absolutely central. Um, okay, we have a great question here from Peter Lee. Thank you, Jennifer, for the great talk. Is it too early to send the proposal to ban farming to the UNEP um, so that the ending of farming in some countries does not give an opportunity to others to expand or start their farming? So do you have your eyes set? <laughs> Well, maybe Peter knows more about the law than I do. I did not think the UNEP was really a legislative outlet anyway. Um, I think they could um, probably provide guidance and that would be wonderful. I think I think nothing's too ambitious, nothing's too nothing's off the table and um, and a lot of it as noted you know with Senator Whitehouse, who again is really interested in the ocean has to do with these individual, motivations. So by all means, if you know someone at, in the UNEP, if I can help, if anyone here can help, um, I, I see no objection. I would, I would like to think, and, and Becca and I have talked extensively about this, but that this whole issue is a kind of prism through which to see aquaculture generally, or I think you described it as a crack in the door that then we could sort of get the door open to think about freezing the footprint of aquaculture, of, of rolling things back a bit, of being more strategic moving forward, of just pausing this, this kind of insanity that we're in currently with the domestication or production, mass production of, of these animals, again, who, whom we know very little about. Yeah. Um, Evan Boyer is asking about, we've talked about, you've talked about wildness, welfare, but not the simple issue of individuals being put to death. Is that a communication tactic or does it reflect your feelings on the topic? Um, it's, it's, it's a really it, good question and gets really probably into my personal psychology. Um, I, I guess I have felt that for so long, the attention was on slaughter and that if we could solve slaughter or, or create humane slaughter, that that would somehow give moral license to the industry. And what I am really refusing to do with this octopus farming is allow any reductionist approach. And so the minute, and that was, I think, the essence of at least providing these three pillars, maybe more past that, is to not say, if you can just solve this one element of production, you will have figured it out. If you could just solve the feed, if you could just solve the slaughter, if you could just solve enrichment, like, no, no, we want these animals wild and we're not stopping at anything less. And, and I think that the focus on, on slaughter and, and then by extension, I would say the focus on pain has really um, in some ways detracted from a more holistic um, set of arguments. Although I certainly hear you. And if you read the, the um, long form article that I pointed out, um, the industry is really upset about some of the accusations around slaughter and the ice, the ice slurry, I think they call it euphemistically. Um, and they're, they're saying this is not at all how we'll kill them. And there's a, there's, there's a big debate within that article about the, the um, nuts and bolts of slaughter. But for me, I really don't care. I mean, of course, a terrible death is a terrible death, but for me, the, their lives are so rich and so interesting that every day that that um, octopus vulgaris is spending in captivity is is unacceptable. 
And so yeah. I, I'm focusing, trying to stay focused on that. It is such an interesting tension. I mean, it does get back and I'd love to hear you talk more about it too, that like this, you know, it, it, like this observation with the first Guardian article that they're representing this, you know, octopus living in the ocean and not actually confronting the horrors of what an octopus farm really would look like. But then if you do start putting that imagery out does it just end up becoming normalized people get desensitized to it it you know it, it just seems sort of like oh well this is happening now you know rather than the shock that you would so, so what how do you think about that tension of you know i said I, I sort of glossing over the seriousness of the issue by you know not actually looking at the horrors but then the risk that if you expose yourself to too much horror maybe you get sort of desensitized to it yeah thank you i really think that um when it comes to communication there's just real there's no one single prescription and it really depends and i know that's such an annoying answer but a great example that i think i mentioned briefly is peter godfrey smith who spent so much time with octopuses in the wild and when he saw those YouTube videos, he was upset by them in ways that the, the that exact kind of setting was replicated in the Hawaii farms. And people would go and see an octopus in a barren tank with one maybe brick and reach their hands in and fondle them and feel that they had a really good encounter with a with a wild or you know ranched octopus. So I think that just underscores that it really depends if you know these animals at all for their potential, and then you see them in those tanks, it has a very different effect than if you don't know them at all, and this is your first encounter. And maybe, and maybe again, it, it doesn't even preclude that you won't love them or care for them. And I've been thinking a lot about the experiments and science done on whales in captivity and, and how much that led to a change and protections for them in the wild. And these were animals kept in really unacceptable conditions. Um, and yet the knowledge that we gleaned from that seems to have been important for making changes to their protections globally. So I don't know that there is a single um, a single best way and a lot was done for octopuses in in captivity but then i think when you get my octopus teacher and you see the richness and you see what their lives look like in the intertidal zone it just changes the parameters of the conversation yeah yeah um okay so i think there's a couple of questions here um This has kind of come up a little bit, but maybe we can just spend a little bit more time talking about it directly. Is um, Natalie J. Swick, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, I'm certainly mispronouncing that and I apologize. Um, so uh, Natalie asks about, uh, you know, wild cut octopuses. Um, does it, the procedure involve holding them in cramped conditions? and killing them by humane methods as well. And if so, like eating wild cooked octopus would raise some of the same concerns, or maybe that would be a way to sort of an entry point. Have you gotten any concern or pushback from people worried about protecting the ability to kill and eat wild caught octopuses? Do you see the potential to extend um, to eating octopuses in general? So we did talk about that a little bit, but what are your thoughts about sort of like is that a direction that you're interested in going? Um, or do you think it's like, stop with the, because we have gotten explicitly people saying like, well, I'm not gonna stop eating octopuses, but I'll, I'm not in favor of them being farmed, but I'm not gonna stop eating them. Yeah, and this is really making me realize, you know, I have all these visions of myself that I'm not an incrementalist. And then it's like, of course, I look at me, of course I am, because wouldn't it be much better 
And then there was a great New York article on not eating octopuses. And in fact, you know, that's been said about my octopus teacher many times. You know, a lot of people don't order octopuses off the menu anymore. And isn't that a better, would, we wouldn't have to worry about octopus farming if no one was eating octopuses. So you could leapfrog. And I still, you know, as you could tell, have a lot of affinity and concern for the wild octopuses too. So have I compromised that goal by even going for the farmed octopus question? And I think that's a really legitimate potential criticism. Um, and maybe again, and maybe that's the kind of part of, is it strategic about slaughter? Because if you don't talk about slaughter, then you don't have to talk about the wild octopuses. That certainly is not my intent. And yet I could see a read of that that could be really concerning. Um, I don't think that animals are slaughtered humanely in general, um, certainly not in fisheries. And in octopuses, at least when I've seen what happens, it's they're caught in traps and then in some scenarios, in some scenarios, they're poisoned out of their dens and then they're killed by any variety of means like a knife to their mantle and they often aren't fully dead. I mean, their nervous system is distributed. It's not pretty. None of it's pretty. And I don't know what the best method would be. And I don't actually want to spend much time thinking about it because it's not where I want to live. Um, so all that to say, All that to say, I'm sort of stuck in wanting to be as ambitious as possible and, and wanting to get something done. And I think that that's just a really hard place for all of us to live. And a lot of times you get people who refuse to get anything done, and I think they often make a big, a bigger difference because they can live purely in the world of ideas and, and moral philosophy or whatever the case may be. I am, you know, a Midwesterner and a little bit more of a political pragmatist. And that may wind up being a huge regret because I may I, I may look back on life and think I should have really just fought the entire time to stop eating octopuses. Um, and I, I, I don't want this to come at that expense. And yet it was so clear in that we could get momentum and support for not farming them in a way that we just weren't going to get for not eating them um, yeah at this point in, at that point in time and to me also it just makes me reflect on there might be specific issues or specific papers or specific agendas that we're working on that someone's working on we collectively you know all of us that are concerned about animals and animal protection where you have to make a choice. And it's like, you can't do both. You can't have it be a farming ban and a no more eating of octopus ban. You have to pick. But that doesn't, that binary choice or those like incompatibilities in a particular case that you're working on doesn't have to exist at the level of you as an individual. Like you can also, as an individual work on, you know, making arguments for not eating octopuses at all as well. Um, so like that choice can happen on a case by case basis, but that doesn't necessarily have to like characterize your like entire strategy. Um, or maybe it does. I don't know. What do you think? Like, do you lose legitimacy if you're like in one setting saying like, no, this is just about farming. And then in another setting saying like, actually, no, I think nobody should eat octopuses. Which is essentially what I'm doing here. And that yeah. is sort of like, um, I think it's more of a kind of nested, a nuance, you know, that you know there there are people that might share your your values, you know, in in smaller settings, and you might know that that just doesn't have mass appeal. Not that it never will. I mean, I can envision that future. I'm not giving up hope. It's just that it it felt like this was a really urgent issue. That if these farms started getting built, that then it was surely over you know, and so sort of trying to stop something before it started, before there was octopus obstructionist, before there was an octopus lobby in place, um, felt of the essence so much so that I was willing to put aside the, the bigger goal. Um, but I really appreciate anyone else who's working on that or wants to 
you know, criticize this work in favor of that. I have no issues with that and, and co completely understand. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much. That's such a, a great place to end. I think we're at time now. Um, so I just want to say thank you again for sharing your work, sharing this history, um, the combination of strategies. It's really, um, you know, you said there was a lot of luck involved, but there was also you and it made all the difference. So um, thank you uh, for sharing and thank you for your work on this. Well, there was also, as I hope the talk showed, it was really an homage to NYU animal studies and the kinds of things that can happen in the midst of people who care about similar things, maybe through different ways and in different ways. And I think it's a really special place. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would like to thank Jeff, and my co-host extraordinaire, uh, for your always great introductions and support. Um, Sophia for helping us set this up. Uh, do you think that uh, we did get a lot of interest in this letter? Do you think the best way would be to just send out an email after the fact, um, Jeff? Unfortunately, or yes, because the letter is not ready. So I can't yeah. send a link or it'll have to be after the fact. Okay. So, so I think we anyone... can do that along with the video recording. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So we will be responding with a follow up email. So keep your eyes out open for that. And thank you again to the Brooks uh, Institute for supporting this uh, series. Very grateful. And to all of you for joining us on this afternoon to talk about banning octopus farming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Have a great spring and summer, uh, everybody. We will see you at events next year.